This is Changeling the Podcast. Welcome to Changeling the Podcast. Come for the glamour, stay for the vibes. I'm your host, Josh, and with us tonight is our other host, Puka. Say hi, Puka. Good evening. What are we talking about tonight, Puka? Well, we have a very special guest host with us today, podcaster Victor Kinzer from Walking Away from Arcadia, Shadowbound, and other assorted projects that we can mention at some point. And we'll be talking about the crossover between Changeling and Wraith in continuation of our spoopy theme for October. Hello, thank you for having me. It's great. So, Victor, what's this uh, game called Wraith all about? Yeah, Wraith the Oblivion. It was the fourth game in the World of Darkness. It is the least played. And it is what it sounds like. The prompt seems pretty simple. You're going to play a ghost. The implementation is winding and complicated and beautiful and poetic and nearly impossible to play it's great fodder for the other games wraith is this incredibly rich ground to go to for npcs whether they're antagonistic or or there to help you it's notoriously the game everyone wants to play and very few people have i've successfully run a six-month chronicle and like a two-month chronicle and a couple con games And it's the hardest storytelling I've ever done in my life. (laughs) Um, The whole premise of Wraith is, on its surface, pretty typical ghost story. You died, you have unfinished business. The devil is in the details of what that unfinished business means. Wraith has this tension where in the underworld, there is this force at the very, very bottom of existence that just wants to consume everything. It's called Oblivion. And there's an actual place where Oblivion draws you to, and it's always pulling you. At the same time, you don't want to just cease to exist. Like, if you go to Oblivion, (laughs) if you go to the pit, you literally cease to be. I often describe it, and my, like, last, like, one little tidbit of, like, solid werewolf lore is I kind of get the cosmology. I don't know the, the details. We were talking about this before the record. For people that don't know Wraith well, but know other parts of the World of Darkness... Oblivion is like the one functional head of the Wyrm. It's the one part of the Wyrm that is still just consuming. And as with everything in the world of darkness that's like dark and consumptive and entropy, it is evil and violent and corruptive and tragic. And so you have this tension between living and existing, existing in this place with this pull towards the pit and a desire to reach towards the living world to, you know, deal with your unresolved trauma, usually. Sometimes it's not trauma, but a lot of times it is. And then you just existing between those two poles. And the thing that makes Wraith especially weird is the entire society, the entire culture is built up around making sure things don't fall to oblivion. Because if they do, the pit gets larger and more powerful and has more minions, and the world just generally becomes a more terrible place. And so the societies of wraiths, and they're different societies and different cultures, but the one you play in in the main game setting is the European and North American one called Stygia, all have all these rules and laws that are basically built around no atrocity is as bad as feeding oblivion. So we will commit... Any horrible, awful, terrible thing, as long as it prevents the pit from claiming more souls. And that's not great. And it's unjust. And it's, I mean, it's atrocious in a way that even the Sabbat isn't really atrocious. And you have to exist in this place, but it's also all built on a dysfunctional bureaucracy. And so that's kind of the setting. It's a feel-good game. Oh, it's... (laughs) No, it is the least feel-good game I've ever played. (laughs) Um, yeah, it's, it's funny just how immediately dark Wraith feels. 
I would yeah. argue Wraith is weirdly hopeful, and it's because of uh, actually the way they do their villains. So mm. all the games have their villains. You got your Thalane, your Adheen, your you know Fomori, your Fallen, etc. But in Wraith, you have specters. Every Wraith has a part of themselves that is drawn to oblivion. It's like all of your worst impulses. And worst can mean different things for different people. Maybe it's your abusive parent. Maybe it's the part of you that just really wants to go out and do drugs and party. Maybe it's the part of you that insists on perfection in a way that's unattainable and terrible for you. Um, but there is some part of you that's like a part of your psyche that is given independent existence by its proximity to oblivion. It's called your shadow. And it's always whispering to you and trying to get you to basically trying to sabotage you. And it's it's never quite that straightforward. But if it takes over, if it becomes the dominant personality, as it were, you become a specter. And specters, the way they're written up, they're the big bads of Wraith, they're absolutely horrible. I mean, they're grotesque in a way that even Fomori aren't grotesque. But the interesting thing about specters is just the way you have a shadow, they have a psyche. You, if you become a specter, continue to exist as the voice in the back of their mind telling them they can be better. No other big bad in the world of darkness has something like that. And Wraith actually systematizes its version of Golconda. It's called Transcendence, where you re-enter the cycle and you're reborn and you do what you're supposed to do. And there are all these weird implications that even once upon a time, the servants of Oblivion kind of served Transcendence. Like they were there to get people that were really failing out of the cycle and keep the people that were reincarnating, you know, make sure the good ones reincarnated. And that functional process has fallen apart over the centuries, millennia. But the fact that even the worst specter could go through a healing process with their psyche, become a wraith again, could resolve everything and transcend, that's a like explicit path to redemption none of the other games presents. And I always found that really fascinating about wraith. So aside from that, because clearly that's presumably the foundation when you're saying it's one of the most hopeful games, that overarching narrative, what are some of the other themes that might come up in just an average Wraith session that characters or that players would want to lean into? So one of the big things in Wraith is tragedy and uh, resolving tragedy. It's not just tragedy for tragedy's sake, but you're playing death. You're playing the experience of death and still caring about the people who you've left behind. And so there are definitely a lot of themes of grief, of wanting what's best for them, but also reconciling jealousy and compersion. And mm -hmm. people might not know what compersion is. Compersion is kind of the opposite of jealousy, where jealousy is seeing someone having something good and both wanting it for yourself and being a little angry that they have it. And compersion is seeing someone else have something good and being happy for them, feeling joy at their joy. And your character is capable of, of both. Uh, wraiths are really, really driven by emotion. And so you have on your stat sheet what are called passions. And so you might have a passion that your daughter that you left behind, you know, gets her act together and makes a great life for herself and is successful. And you might have a dark passion that is about, you know, yourself as an overbearing parent and her paying for all of her, you know, screw ups. Mm -hmm. And you can feel both of those things simultaneously. So I think one of the biggest themes in Wraith is that tension and what do you do with that? It's a big part of why people struggle playing Wraith. The goals don't tend to be big and mythic and fun. They tend to be quiet and intimate and claustrophobic. <laughs> um <laughs> And so it's a hard, like, if you can get into it, it's so beautiful. It is not a mindset that a lot of role players get into easily. Yeah. But a, a lot of the themes have to, to do with that. The other theme, I would say the more epic accessible themes have to do with the big corrupt political structure and mm -hmm. rebelling against that. And how do you rebel against that? Because there are reasons for all of the unjust rules. They don't necessarily justify all of the injustices. Like they aren't good enough reasons, but the tension of, well, you shouldn't just soul forge all of these, you know, souls down just because they don't have the strength to resist oblivion. 
but what's the alternative if you succeed at getting rid of that system? Well, up until you hit the word soul forge, that description could have very easily applied to changeling as well, I think. Yeah, I I feel like changeling and wraith have a lot in common. I feel like in a lot of ways they're mirror images of each other. Hmm. Because, you know, in Wraith, I described the very hopeful view, but it's a very aesthetically grim, dark, depressing game. In Changeling, the aesthetic is much brighter, much more hopeful, but like you're going to fall to banality. Yeah. And if you don't fall to banality, it's because you've engaged in some coping mechanisms that are going to push you right over the edge of functional. And that's just the reality. And you can't look at it too hard. And it's just like this perfect inversion in terms of aesthetic and actually kind of gnawing horribleness of Wraith. And that's something that's always struck me about the two games. Hmm. Yeah, you can also think of it like a changeling when they've gone through their chrysalis. Arguably, they're, this is the best point in their life. At least if you think about their, their human life. A ra- when you're a ghost, I think you've hit the rock bottom at that point. Not me. I know it could get Usually, worse, but uh, th- there's a lot more up to go. <laughs> there is generally a lot more up to go. Uh, the thing that motivates you to go up is that you can see that there is more down to go. Yep. But it's a down that you never imagined when you were still alive. <laughs> I think the other thing that's interesting about Wraith, kind of as it relates to Changeling, is a little bit of the history about specifically Stygia. So the history is it, it ties into Changeling is a lot about the European connection there. But Stygia was founded by Karin, who was a Roman. And the rise of Stygia largely coincides with the rise of the Roman Empire. And you have this whole history that's kind of the height of the Fae. I mean, you could argue if you go back far enough, you get into truly mythic periods for the Fae. But if you want to talk about before Christianity came in, before the shattering, before the sundering, when the Fae were in a relationship with humanity that arguably could be its most functional. It's hard to say. The game is ambiguous about that time on purpose. If we look at real history, it's ambiguous. It's at least a Silver Age. of. (laughs) Yeah, it's at least a Silver Age. There are wraiths that were alive and saw that. Memories of that still exist. And that is a time period that for changelings is completely locked away by the mists. And it's hard to get to those wraiths. And much like Methuselahs, they are unbelievably powerful. But unlike Methuselahs, they're not necessarily evil. I wouldn't trust them. That kind of age does all kinds of weird things to motivations. But they're not intrinsically malevolent the way a vampire that age is probably become. And I think that having someone that actually lived through that with some rather questionable miss dynamics, like... How are rates really impacted by the mist is a big question mark that they imply that rates are maybe resistant to the mist. The Shadowlands doesn't have the same relationship with the dreaming that the the physical world does. That opens up a lot of really interesting possibilities because even the Fae can't get back to, you know, accurate depictions of what went on during that period. So I think the fact that the major political order in Wraith draws a line all the way back to the Roman Empire potentially makes it very interesting to changelings. And speaking of that political order, can you say a bit about the guild structure? Yeah. So the other thing that's weird about Wraith is you don't have splats. And I know most people listening probably know what that term means. It's a a shorthand. When the games used to be developed, they'd kind of put an asterisk next to each group and it looked like a splat. So they nicknamed like the generic group name for this game was splat. And the thing about all the other games is you have to pick a kith, you have to pick a clan, you have to pick a tribe. You know, sometimes there's like an orphan caitiff kind of option, but they're really fringe. In Wraith, the splats are the guilds, officially. They're the ones that get the big page write-ups, and nobody is a member of them. Like as PCs, you don't get to be a member of the guilds. It's so weird. The guilds are organizations that we're built up around the major powers. So it's kind of like you'd have a glass blowers guild in a medieval era that was responsible for all of the art of glass blowing and you weren't allowed to blow glass unless you went through the proper initiation processes and found a master to take you on as an apprentice who was a guild member, etc. There was a similar 
a process like that in the history of Stygia. And then due to one of Karin's temper tantrums, which was very likely his shadow taking over for a while, they never officially say Karin's shadow takes over, but it it's a thing that if you read the canon, it's very clear that sometimes his shadow is running the show. And the breaking of the guilds is one of those times. There's a fiction piece about it in the Partners Guild book, I believe. The actual experience is there. They leave things a little ambiguous, but it's very clear his shadow took over. And he said, the guilds are terrible. They are betraying Stygian society. They are betraying me. And he made them illegal, which was a huge problem. So you're not allowed to be in a guild officially, but they still exist because if they'd actually destroyed them, society would have fallen apart. And I mean, this is a Changeling podcast. I don't want to get too far into why society would have fallen apart. That's way in the weeds of of Wraith metaplot. But suffice it to say that without someone to really hold and harness the powers that the Wraiths use the Society of the Dead would collapse and the Spectres would take over. Um, There are a couple guilds in particular that are indispensable. And so he broke them officially. He couldn't, like, admit he was wrong, because if he admitted he was wrong, his enemies would take advantage. And again, political chaos, the Spectres take over. And so they just created this kind of middle ground where it's like, well, officially they're illegal. But if you're in one of the useful guilds and you don't make waves, we'll look the other direction. And so then you end up with like the really useful guilds, the not useful, but not that dangerous guilds, and then the really, really threatening guilds. And like how, how much that like their illegal is enforced varies depending on the group you're a member of, but no PC is powerful enough to join one, at least not when you first create your characters. So you all start characters without a group, which is a very alien experience for World of Darkness players. Mm-hmm. So out of all of them, which ones would you say are most relevant to Changeling? So the obvious one there is the Sandmen. And they're... Obviously. Yeah, obviously. The the Sandmen manipulate dreams. They can force people to go to sleep. They can enter their target's dreams. You get basically your Freddy Krueger kind of situation there. In the case of a Spectre, with the Wraith Sandman, you would have you know a less malevolent version of that. And so there's a lot of opportunity for changelings and sandmen to run into each other. There's opportunity for anyone who's using Phantasm, I believe it is, is their Arkanoi, which is the name of their powers, to run into changelings. But if you're not a sandman, if you don't wield that kind of power and you run into a changeling, the changeling is probably going to wreck you. Because as powerful as wraiths can become, You know, they don't have anything that compares to unleashing. They don't have anything like calling on the weird. So a a medium level wraith against a changeling is generally going to lose. But the Sandmen wield some really weird powers. How how would you say that stacks? Not that we're going to get into like battle comparison of powers, but like uh, how would you say that compares to Onomancy for the changelings? Do you think like? Yeah, I would say by and large. Onirmancy is probably comparable to Phantasm. Phantasm has some powers that let you manipulate people, like put people to sleep. It has the ability not just to engage with a sleeping person and their dreams, but to manipulate kind of the relationship of their dreams to craft illusions. Phantasm is maybe like one part Onirmancy, one part chicanery. Mm-hmm. And a couple other little things mixed in. So it's it's not a one-to-one comparison. And I would say at the high level of Onirmancy, you're probably a little more powerful than the high level of Phantasm. But the thing about Wraiths is, so if you want to buy a new art, it's kind of expensive. I think it's level times five, if I remember correctly. That sounds right, yeah. 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 And then you have to pair it with Realms. Arkadoi are level times three which is something that always kind of strikes people. Like, no one is prepared for that power scaling. You don't think you're you're dead. Oh, let's go uh, really level up now. Let's go really level up. And the thing that is hard to understand about that when you're used to the other World of Darkness games is you do not really want to level your Arkanoi quickly because all of the high-level Arkanoi feed your shadow. Mm -hmm. You reach a point where it's like, you want to be powerful? 
cool, you can do terrible and amazing things, and they all draw you closer to oblivion. The experience scaling in Wraith is a trap, and it's there on purpose. And changelings don't have to worry about that BS. <laughs> so there's a weird trade-off there. It, comparing power levels is hard. But but you could, that I guess that would be a big, an obvious place for crossover that is. You're messing yes. with the same dream kind of thing. Yeah, it's an obvious place. There's some stuff in the Sandman Guild book about how they collect sand from changelings. Basically, they can steal glamour um, and turn it into pathos. They're very good at that. So that's kind of a big deal. It makes it very clear in the Sandman book that while you can do this, it's not recommended. Fey are dangerous. Be afraid of them. But the rewards are potentially very large. So I would say of all the groups, the Sandmen are the ones who are most likely to come into opposition with changelings because changelings just look like big piggy banks to them, yeah. which is always dangerous. And if, if I remember correctly, can all wraiths kind of, if they're trying to identify a changeling? So wraiths have life sight, which lets them look at any person across the shroud. So it's a lot like the, the gauntlet is the separation between the physical world and the umbra. The shroud is the separation between the shadowlands or the underworld and the physical world. And uh, a wraith can see across the shroud. And if they can see a person, they can use life sight and tell how close to death they are. And anything that is particularly different on that how close to death are you how full of life are you really stands out to a wraith so they can immediately identify changing breeds because just like the verb with which they are alive stands out and changelings are kind of similar that doesn't mean a wraith knows what they're looking at so the wraith that understands that oh you've got this very particular look to you and are very very alive that means you're a fae I would say most wraiths don't know what it means, but they'll definitely be able to tell you're different. Mm -hmm. To get to the guilds, there are a couple other guilds that I think are really likely to have connections with changelings. One of them is the Nimoy, and their Arkanoi is all about memory. They can dive in and manipulate and implant memories and collect memories. One of the big plot points, the big end times plot point for wraith is that when Karin transcended, they took his memory and they split it up among the, the Nimoy because he would be coming back and they needed to collect his memory again so that he could fulfill his big epic, you know, end time storyline. But that gives you an idea of how deeply connected to memory they are. And while there's nothing published about this, the implications of being able to manipulate memory that completely, and I mean like 10 powers... Because the Arkanoi have five levels, and they have a common five levels, and a special only the guild knows them five levels. You can get all ten levels as a character. To have like that scope of manipulative power around memory, to me with changelings and remembrance dynamics, opens up a lot of possibilities. Because I think a Nimoy tinkering around in the head of a changeling would have better access to their remembrance than they probably do. And to me, that's always just been a huge plot opportunity. It's almost like doing a file repair on their vague shards of memory from Arcadia. That might be helpful. Yeah, exactly. But because the mists are so aggressive, that repair, you might be the only, like the Wraith might be the only one that can actually read those files. Because if you actually had the Changeling yeah. read them, the mist would still come in and just be like, nope. And so I just picture this kind of thing, like with Delirium in Sandman. Uh -huh. It's like, I know things none of you know and could ever know. And an Emoy could know things about a changeling the changeling isn't even capable of knowing. And that's dangerous, especially if you run a game where oaths transfer across incarnations, which is a common thing in the st in the plot of changeling, mm. in, the, in the meta. Using it for PCs is generally a big story thing, but it, it is a pretty big theme that you've reincarnated and you're bound to this oath that you don't know anything about and maybe because of the mist can't know anything about. But what if a Nimoy could? That just strikes me as like a really interesting plot intersection to play around with. The other guild that I think has the potential, a little bit less so, but the potential to 
interact with changelings are the solicitors. And their arcanoi is all about desire. They can make someone want or not want something. And I mean, it's it's an ugly arcanoi. It feeds the shadow a lot. There's a consent content warning next to it in Wraith 20th. It's just like, if you use this, be very clear with your players because it's it's kind of worse than dominate and sovereign combined because you can just look at someone and be like oh you you loved that person you're totally completely in love with that person i'm taking that away you don't want them anymore and the idea of how that would interact with reverie if a solicitor started doing that to a dreamer that was being actively reveried one that story could cross a lot of boundaries for a lot of people <laughs> But it does tap some really interesting changeling themes. Yeah, that is kind of like I, I think it was recently I finally cl I clued in that Sovereign, it, it can do terrible things, but it can just make you physically do stuff. It's not a, mm -hmm. it doesn't change your mind. That's the yeah, that's way more horrifying. There's that one that one story in Fool's Luck that's kind of a really ugly example <sighs> of that. It's it's the most the yeah. It's one of the best pieces of writing in the entire line, but it's really like, oh. It, it is. That that bit about what happened to all of those commoners is, mm -hmm. I go back to that a lot. I think about that story a lot when I'm thinking about the she and how to use them in my, in my games. Yep. I also, I have to ask about, because this is one of the few things that I know about Wraith and what makes it distinctive is the mechanics surrounding the shadow. So can you explain a little bit about how that works within a group? Yeah, so I'll describe the most common recommended form of shadow play. The books generally have two or three alternative approaches, but the most common approach to shadow play is every single player plays themselves and someone else's shadow. It's usually in a round robin kind of situation where I play myself and the shadow of the player on the left. And it's ideally a very collaborative process and the shadow gets experience just like the player does it's at a slower rate it's an abbreviated character sheet so you don't have as many things to purchase but you level you have powers you can use and it's a really weird dynamic because everyone is so used to collaborative problem solving and what can i do to get my party through this but in wraith you are both embodying that character and always looking for an opportunity to subvert what's going on through the player where you're the shadow. And you go over and you whisper in their ear and you try to convince them to do the wrong thing or you, to be blunt, verbally abuse their character, which is something that you really have to carefully navigate, abuse the character, not the player. And that's mm -hmm. a thing that, you know, is always talked about explicitly in Wraith is that Everybody has an X card, and it's really important that you feel comfortable using it in Wraith because it's very easy for bleed to get out of hand. My experience with shadow play is most players go a little camp with it. Most players aren't comfortable being really horribly, like, creepingly subversive, and it's hard to get to treat your friends that way. But there is potential there to, to really subtly undermine, and you can use powers that will just make other people think you're a specter or summon specters or just force you to say things that will, you know, mess up your relationships. The The power list, they're called thorns, is, is pretty long. And you develop a, a power stat like Glamour or like the Wraith's Pathos, um, which is called Angst. Pathos is all of the, I'd call them normal emotions. They don't all have to be positive, but they're within the range of like, functional emotions and angst is that same sort of energy it's emotional energy but it's just like self-loathing hatred for other people it's all the most intense destructive stuff and your shadow accumulates that and spends that as a resource and so yeah there's always this tension about what am i doing am i subverting or helping the group and someone else is doing that to you at the same time. So it, it makes it very difficult when someone misses a Wraith game. <laughs> yeah. On the one hand, I'm inclined to say it would be interesting to see how that mechanic could be ported into Changeling, if at all. But then on the other hand, if you were to peg it to like Seely versus Unseely, it seems much lower stakes than between Wraith and Spectre. That seems like a much more major 
dichotomy? I do think it would be lower stakes, although I don't think that would be bad for introducing people to mm. the approach. Because I yeah. also think that the Sealy unseely thing in Changeling is a little underdeveloped. Absolutely. Like, I love it conceptually. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and sometimes it's like, no, I want my my alternate court to take control. Like, I, I need to be a little unseely right now. And getting comfortable flipping back and forth you know, getting over some of the prejudice that each court has for the other could be a really interesting story arc and really mm -hmm. productive. It wouldn't need to be as uncomfortable as it needs to be in Wraith. Yeah. Food for thought. Mm hmm Do we want to jump into key terms? Yeah, I think we did actually hit most of them. But if there are others that you, I mean, fetters, I think, is the big one. Yeah, so I've talked about passions a little bit with race that everyone has the things that they they're really passionate about making happen their un, unresolved business but they're also fetters which are physical things that a wraith is connected to and there would actually anchor a wraith to the underworld if you lose all of your fetters you cannot exist in the shadowlands and you will descend into the tempest don't want to get too far into the weeds of wraith <laughs> cosmology which gets really confusing but suffice it to say Losing your ability to be in the Shadowlands is not a great thing. Most of the oldest, most powerful wraiths have lost all their fetters. They cannot exist in the Shadowlands anymore. So the really powerful Methuselah-like wraiths, the Death Lords, they can't come to the surface. They can't access the world. Um, and there are places they can hide. They can continue to exist. Stygia itself is, actually exists well underneath the Shadowlands. But fetters are also, fetters could be like your daughter that you left behind or your favorite book that, you know, you read your entire life, like a particular physical copy of it, or the statue where you proposed to your spouse. And so these things that have these deep emotional connections for you, but they're actual physical places and you actually slumber in them. And I think fetters are the thing that offers the most practical way for most changelings to interact with wraiths. Because you have your death kith, you have your slua that can just talk to wraiths if they want to, and the Yorona kith, which has some connections around the Shadowlands, although they behave a little differently. But for most changelings, you know, how would I ever talk to a wraith? But changelings can can care about physical places a lot and chimerical reality is very reactive to emotions and feelings and dreams and wraiths do dream when they slumber in their fetters and so i feel like around a fetter you might start to see some leaking into chimerical reality and you might be able to interact with a thing like what happens if someone comes up and uses will o whisper on the tree that is a fetter for a wraith that opens up some really interesting possibilities. One of the player characters, Freehold, is a fetter. That would be. <laughs> yeah. And a Kinane can become a wraith. Uh, changelings don't become wraiths. I mean, golden rule. You can always yeah. break the there, rules. There was, there was like one. There's a few first edition books that say they can, but I don't like it. <laughs> if you're yeah. killed with cold iron and then it says like your fey main would be what you look like as a wraith. And I'm like, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. First edition changeling was weird, okay? <laughs> um, there are lots of things in first edition changeling I look at and I go, well, that was an interesting story. <laughs> but, um, yeah, but Kinane could can very easily become Wraith. And if anything, a lot of the stories about Kinane and their relationships to changelings, which are, let's be honest, often abusive, especially if they are connected with the she. Those are the sorts of things that leave people with unfinished business. And they certainly have a lot of force of will um, to survive that. And force of will is an important part of not falling to oblivion. So Kinane could very easily become wraiths and they could very easily have a freehold as a fetter because they probably have a strong connection with them. I think most freeholds, you'd have a hard time coming up with a story where a random human cared about it enough to have it as a fetter. You might have some public freeholds, but they're pretty rare. Most changelings are a little insular about them, but Kinane definitely open up that possibility. 
It also makes for interesting connections with the folklore surrounding the, the equivalence between fairyland and the underworld. So that's something maybe to explore as well. Yeah, way back when we were doing early, early walking away from Arcadia and we did an episode where we just kind of ran through all the kiths and described them and we tried to look up the source myths. We got a couple things wrong. But one thing I did find in there was that the original myths around the Slua is that they were spirits of the dead. A few different myths, nothing super uniform when you go back that far, but that was certainly a, a common theme. And they were spirits that had been trapped in fairy instead of moving on into their appropriate afterlife or to heaven. And obviously all the fairy myths got really modified by Christianity. So there's some of that going on there as well. But when I thought about that, I thought, oh, that's really interesting. There's not really anything in Changeling like that. And I put it to the back of my mind. And then I read about the Karamet. And I went, oh, no, this Mm -hmm. is that myth. The Karamet are basically the original Sluashi myth. And... uh, Then I read about the Black Paths of Balor, and that's kind of all the stuff that lives in that fairyland is the underworld. You can be trapped there instead of moving on. For people who don't know, the Black Paths of Balor are trods in the dreaming that eventually lead into the underworld, and they are not part of the Silver Path. They're not part of the Silver Ban. The Tuahatadanan have nothing to do with them, but they are pathways through the dreaming, And the Karamet are an Adheen group that are human souls who've been trapped in the dreaming and have become fae. So you use arts, you use realms, you build the character like a fae, but it's it's very clearly stated you used to be human and then you died and you went here instead of the underworld. And uh, there's just so much potential there and there's so much possibility for if you have these paths that go from the underworld right to the dreaming... Why couldn't wraiths or specters or other things, you know, crawl up into the dreaming through these pathways? Or why couldn't changelings make their way all the way to the underworld? Which the underworld with its like gray, drear, dead, static sort of state, a lot of people interpret that as banal. But in all the writing, wraiths are very low banality. They average like four, Hmm. which is like just above children. Mm Mm-hmm. And so it's one of those things where it's like, it's drear, but it is not without belief. It is not, it's soul crushing, but in a way that acknowledges a scope of existence that is so grand that it can't be banal. And that's a very strange experience for most changelings. Did they have that talking about like Stygia and those ancient wraiths and stuff like that with banality too? Or is that like, I don't play your character or... Yeah, Yeah, I I think that gets into the an area where the games acknowledge each other, but often the deep lore from one game won't really be explained in terms of another Mm -hmm. game. So I don't think I've ever seen anything that talks about what the banality of a Death Lord would look like. And the Death Lords are like the the prime example of those very, very old wraiths. There's also a lot of weird stuff going on with the Death Lords that relates to remembrance and could in theory be manipulated by changelings. So I don't know if people care about spoilers or or if you want to be a pure Wraith player and not know all the, the deep secrets, maybe skip the next minute or two. But <laughs> the Death Lords are a lie. Only one of them has remained in power from the beginning. And the rest of them have died several times. And they all have masks that they wear. And when you don a Death Lord's mask, you are made to look exactly like that Death Lord looked when they were originally raised to that office. And you inherit all of the memories of everyone who has worn the mask before you and you become that person effectively. So the even if you were to capture the mask on its own, separate of the Death Lord, it would have all of those memories. Again, going all the way back to pre-sundering in some cases. Well, with the Death Lords, in all cases, they were all established before the sundering so there's also a whole weird thing that you could play around with there um there's one death lord that has really remained unchanged but she's um the one who basically got car into found stygia and she's the exception to all things reasonable in the world of darkness so is she is she the one that's possibly eve no, it's confirmed that it's confirmed that she's Eve in Ends of Empire. Okay. Um, yes, that is the Lady of Fate, and yes, she is Eve, as in Adam and Eve. Um, it's like, well, you you might yeah. be a vampire, you might have Cain, but we've got Eve. We've got his mom. Right? Yeah, 
Yeah, and like when you look at what she's capable of doing, and it's all in yeah. very vague mythic terms, she's she is something else entirely. <laughs> no, I was just at the really weird idea of like, well, you can't meet all these ancient wraiths because there's there's other old wraiths that aren't death lords, right? Like it's not like there are there are yeah. plenty of old wraiths that are yeah. not death lords. Yeah, and then I'm like, okay, so if you want to meet them and you're a changeling, even though you're a slua, you can't just talk to them because they can't be there, right? So then it's like a weird idea. It's like, well, if you manage to go through those Black Paths of Balor, then go to Stygia and then you steal a, a mask and then you put the Death Lord mask on. What would that do? But yeah, it's true. I mean, and there are there are some older wraiths that have managed to keep a fetter or two intact. They're rare, but they do exist. So you could find a couple very old wraiths that have been very, very fastidious about their things. Um, and all of Wraith society and politics and backstabbing really kind of boils down to destroying fetters. There are whole power sets that are explicitly about hunting down your enemy's fetters and destroying them. So making it to two, 300 years old and still having fetters is no small accomplishment. But there are plenty of Wraiths that pull it off. But that would be the exception. Like if you were a Slua and you had a connection with somebody like that, you dumped a lot of points into your spirit contact. <laughs> yep. Well, I guess oh, there's another thing I just remembered. Maybe you could explain um, sort of the relevant equivalent of the Ashit for the for Stygia. Yeah, there are a number of laws. The most important one, and I say important, it is not followed really at all, but they make a big show out of it, is the Dictum Mortem. And the Dictum Mortem, it's not like a series of laws the way you have with the Ashit or the traditions. It's really, you will not interfere with the living world. So all wraiths basically have a full set of motivations to muck about in the living world. All their passions are about that. It's what they need to continue to survive. If they don't fulfill their passions, they're probably oblivion bait. And yet there's this law in place that Karin passed that says you won't involve yourself at all. And it's the biggest joke. I mean, all of the World of Darkness games kind of acknowledge the hypocrisy of their rules, their laws. I would argue Changeling does the least of that, even though a couple aspects of the Ashit would very likely fall into this, okay, but do they actually follow it category? Hmm. But with Wraith, it is the primary plot point, is that it's a law that you can totally be taken away and soul forged for breaking and no one actually follows it. It's just like, are you good enough at keeping up appearances to have plausible deniability? And I mean, it goes into like the worst violation of the dictum mortem is becoming a risen. And the risen are basically Eric Draven. Think the crow. The book was literally written to simulate the crow. And, uh, going through that process and re-entering the living world through your body and all of that is just like the greatest violation of the dictum mortem. But in the Risen book, they're very clear that most of the race that are able to like gather the resources necessary to do it, because it's really, really, really difficult, are probably doing it at the command of a high-level hierarchy wraith. It's probably something that's been ordered from within the power structure. And it's just like, yeah, we know it's a total violation of our law. Now you're going to go do it for us. And it's just really baseline in Wraith. It's more obvious than in the other games that I've played. Can you talk a bit about the underworld perspective on reincarnation, given that that's such an essential part of the changeling experience? Yeah, so Wraith is interesting because it is the only game that I'm aware of that just 100% confirms that it's Golconda equivalent works. Hmm. Even in Changeling, with I want to say the C20 player's guide, they really got a bit more explicit with the, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna butcher this pronunciation. I, I know that, the Sio Chan. <laughs> they were there was still a little bit of unreliable narrator there. But in Wraith, reincarnation is real. The final end times campaign that you can purchase and play is Karin dying again because he was reincarnated and he went through transcendence and you having to gather up the Nimoy that have the pieces of his personality and putting him back together. And it's just published canon. It's just so interesting having such a big metaphysical plot point 
be that concrete in a World of Darkness game. Um, so wait, is Transcendence is always reincarnation? Always. I'll put an asterisk by that because golden rule. Um, that's the implication. Oh, okay. The implication is that if you transcend, you will reincarnate. And most people transcend automatically. So if you don't have a bunch of trauma and a bunch of hangups dragging you down towards oblivion, you don't go to the underworld. Lots of people never show up in the underworld. They just re-enter the cycle. And uh, there are very few ways to confirm that because unlike changelings, humans don't have remembrance. And so even the Nimoy can't go in and, and pull your memories from a previous life. That's not something they put in the systems. I would argue they probably could with changelings because of the remembrance dynamic, but they can't with other people. So it's one of those things where here's a hard system. You can work towards it. We've systematized it, but like we won't confirm it. And then in the very last Wraith book, they just confirmed it. And so, yeah, it's it's a really interesting dynamic. The thing with Wraiths is they by and large believe in reincarnation because another dynamic with Wraith, this isn't something that matters so much for Changeling, but every afterlife that could ever be imagined exists in the Tempest. They're called the Far Shores. They're these far off islands where every imagined afterlife has manifest, and they're all a vicious lie. Like, they turn into a slave trade at one point. The realization that they are just this sort of projection that can be easily corrupted and manipulated and was used to create a running slave trade prompts one of Karin's largest like shadow temper tantrums. He does not take to that news well. So you get this, all the afterlifes are a lie. Everyone kind of knows reincarnation happens. And even though they put a system around transcendence, it is brutally hard to do you have to basically give up all of your power and make yourself a walking target you have to give up everything that protects you from being destroyed by oblivion and then walk through that with absolute grace on like a stat sheet level and so it's it's clear that almost no one does it and so it's like this thing that everyone knows about and nobody cares about because it doesn't apply to them i'll never be that person Wraithly society has a weird relationship with reincarnation. Hmm. Changeling society, on the other hand. Changeling society, I mean, they know they reincarnate. Remembrance yeah. is a thing. Remembrance is weird and foggy. Well, unless unless you're a first edition slua who knows the truth. But, yeah. but I digress. <laughs> Another thing that I think is interesting to talk about is death and dark glamour. And, and glamour in general, what does death mean to changelings? And something that I really liked the addition of dark glamour in C20, mm. but the more I played with it, the more I wish it had gone even a little bit further. I wish that glamour was a relative force kind of the way banality is. Yeah, definitely. Be yeah, because what's dark to one changeling wouldn't necessarily be dark to another changeling. And I think death is a good example of that because Dark Glamour, capital D Dark, in Changeling is generally meant to be Thalane, Adheen, Nightmare, Fomorian Fuel. But then you have the Slua or the Yorona, and they are perfectly playable. I'll say Cathane, acknowledging that the Yorona are more Galane, but, but in that range of not of the Fomorians. And they're very closely tied to death, and especially the Yorona are so tied to rituals of death and grieving and, and having this relationship with those who have passed on that's really healthy. And I feel like for most people in the world of darkness, because like the core thesis of the world of darkness, once you get past werewolf, is that our relationship with death is all messed up. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of turn every game into that. Vampires are all about, I must never die, I'm immortal. Werewolves are all about, you know, in werewolf, it's kind of the weirm dynamic of like, Weaver being like, oh no, we can't let things be destroyed. And that threw everything out of whack. Mage gets out of it a little bit. With Wraith, it's very clearly, I can't let go. I can't move on. And Changelings, I have to resist the pull of, of death and banality. I feel like because that's such a core metaphor in the world of darkness, in a lot of cases, death is going to result in dark glamour. It's going to be nightmare because that's the relationship that a lot of things in the world of darkness have with death. 
But again, you get this thing in Wraith. It's in every edition when they talk about harrowings, which are just like when your shadow drags you down and makes you face your darkest, most terrible nightmares. It talks about the fact that millennia ago, that was an important part of transcendence. But over the centuries, it's taken on a more and more sinister tone and become less and less helpful in allowing race to properly resolve their passions and fetters. And the fact that it acknowledges that corruption of the cosmic cycle acknowledges that there's a a functional version of that. And so I think, you know, for anyone out there who's ever watched um, Ask a Mortician on YouTube, uh, (laughs) she talks about this stuff a lot. I think that playing World of Darkness as a way to kind of deal with our own discomfort with death, if if you're playing the role-playing game for that kind of goal, which not everybody does, but Wraith is kind of built for that. And and I would argue Changeling is too. I think there's a lot of potential for like that glamour that bubbles up from a major death event that could be dark, but you've got that death fae who isn't willing to let it be dark. Like they see the potential for it to be something else. And I think that's a really interesting story. The other thing, and this you have to go back to first edition for, in the player's guide, the original player's guide, you get to the Nunyahi, and the Nunyahi can talk to the dead, but they can talk to the dead because they have a special art for it. Um, And it goes through a whole relationship they have with the spirit world. It doesn't specifically talk about ancestors necessarily, but like there's a strong implication that they, this is part of how they connect with their culture. Like it's, It's a little more difficult to just connect with it day to day because, well, cultural genocide. But they gave the Nunyahi this art called Spirit Talk. It was not pulled forward into C20. For, I think, good reason. It suffers a little bit from the infusion problem of not really being designed to work with all the realms. It it just doesn't fit the model. So I understand why they didn't pull it forward, but then they didn't do anything to change the Nunyahi right up to fill Mm -hmm. the hole that left. And I, I do think that some aspect of their power, their ability to go into the spirit world going, all right, we're not going to do a whole art out of this, but we're going to build something in here in that place that still gives them that connection to their dead and their history and their specific dark kingdoms for indigenous populations where you have some very different story crossover there than what we've been talking about with Stygia and European Fae. There's also that whole dynamic in Changeling. And that's that's a big thing, actually, like a whole art and over a dozen kith that can access it. It's transformative in a way that's easy to miss because most people forget it exists. Just anecdotally, I know I've had a couple conversations with people online who have only played C20 and have expressed basically confusion around that same thing. And so when you say, oh, by the way, there was this art, they're they're kind of stunned and wish that it had been brought forward. I think we might have said this also when we did our dive into the first edition player's guide, but it's the kind of thing I would love to see somebody with the requisite knowledge do a homebrew of it and just put it out there to update it. Yeah, I would love to see that. I I think that there's a lot of potential for Wraith crossover that that art would reintroduce. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. yeah. Dreams are free. (laughs) Someday. Someday. Well, until that day comes, perhaps we should talk about a couple connections that are built into the games as they currently stand in their most recent editions and how players and storytellers might integrate them. Yeah, I mean, you go from kind of the most obvious thing. You have the haunted flaw. You have <laughs> a, a slew with a, a spirit contact or an ally. And I think those are things that are really easy for people to imagine. Like, I'm haunted. The Wraith is doing the work to make sure I know they're there. And while changelings don't have a lot of ability to see Wraiths, if a Wraith wants to communicate with a changeling, they have all kinds of options. They can manifest physically, if they're very good at that art. They can slide into dreams and talk to them. They can whisper. They can leave little messages. They have little ways of subtly manipulating the physical world. And so if you have your Wraith NPC do the lift, you don't need to lean on a Slua. It's not totally necessary. And so I think there are a lot of ways to do that. I think what's more interesting is if you have a situation where Changeling and a Wraith join forces. And 
especially with LifeSight, if the Wraith is able to identify, oh, this changeling is is different, and maybe they discover that the changeling is connected to their fetter. And then you could do a little bit of a lift, play around with the rules, like if they are sleeping in the fetter, and then maybe the changeling can imbue that fetter with glamour. You know, you even have situations like if you have an anime involved or Gilly Do, where they can sort of reverie or ravage a thing, an element, you get into some really interesting possibilities with possession and doing that. And wraiths can also possess computers. And so in a modern world, in a contemporary setting, changelings go on the internet. I mean, you've got MMOs being run by by she. So there's a lot of possibility on side of, on kind of like the chimerical web and the the spaces that they've implied exist. It's never been really heavily developed, but there are a couple places in Changeling where they're like, there are chimerical magical corners of the internet. And we're just going to like talk about a couple of them existing. Once you put inhabit in place, which is the Arkanoi where you can kind of inhabit physical things, that includes the internet. There's a lot of possibility that you can do dynamic communication. And as soon as you can communicate, you can coordinate and join mm-hmm. forces. And I think there's a lot of really fun story there. And then obviously all of those things could also lead to animosity. You know, Wraiths as an antagonist is an obvious angle, especially when you get into Spectres or maybe a Wraith with a very powerful shadow that he's a little too susceptible to. There's a lot of possibility there. And and similarly, you could have you could have Thalane coordinating with Wraiths. One thing that's interesting is there isn't really a death Thalane kith because bogies, which are the slew equivalent, are not really associated with death. I've always thought that was a weird miss, given how much death is is dark in the world of darkness. So that might be a gap worth closing. Well, there are, for C20, they introduced the Weeping Whites, and I, I don't know that I would necessarily call them a death kith, but yeah. they're associated with places that have seen death or whatever it is. So that that could work That's for a very particular inflection of that idea. That's true. Do you remember what their birthrights are? Do they have anything that actually makes it easier for them to interact with wraiths? Give me literally eight seconds. Yeah. <laughs> opening the opening the PDF. I had forgotten uh, that they were Thalane. Yeah. So their main endowment, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Their main endowment is to essentially sway a target into following a specific set of actions, generally something that will lead to their injury or death. Mm. And they can also take on a spectral appearance. So they have that sort of haunting and misleading travelers quality to them that, frankly, I, I would tend to associate more with wraiths. Yeah, so it sounds more like that's simulating wraiths. I yeah. think if I were running them as an NPC... I'd probably tweak one of those to give them some ability to see and engage with wraiths. I think that's there's a lot of potential there, especially specters. Man, specters would love them. <laughs> so yeah, I think I think there's a lot of potential there. The other thing about wraiths as antagonists to changelings is wraiths just have a lot of tools to mess up a changeling's day by messing <laughs> up their dreamers. Because you can possess them, you can drain their emotions. If you're a specter, you can fill them with corrupt emotions. You can pull them away. You can manipulate what they want, what they love. You can manipulate and change their memory. And when you think about how dependent changelings are on humans, but how much they like can't acknowledge that, like, I have to go feed on these humans all the time. I really shouldn't kill them in a way even more so than vampires, like, I can't waste a dreamer. But like a wraith can wreck a dreamer, and that's much more precious to a changeling. Yeah, there's also the like all the standard haunting powers they have that could just make that dreamer not get a good night's sleep for weeks. And <laughs> also true. <laughs> um, Phantasmagoria or well, that's God, I'd have one. To look well, it Phantasmagoria, up. Yeah. but there's the one that just lets you move around objects. Even, yep. Even the low level outrage if used properly. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, wraiths, wraiths don't have to attack the changeling. I mean, you can really subvert 
a changeling's food supply. The other thing is, and I just thought of this, you know, we were talking about the Black Paths of Balor. If specters made their way into the dreaming through the Black Paths of Balor, they have an arcanoid called Tempest Weaving, where they can literally rewrite reality. They can create byways, which are a little bit like trods. They can rip them apart. They can create labyrinths. And having access to that, you know, being able to come in and look at a freehold and say, okay, I have made contact with the Dreaming because I was lucky enough to stumble across a Black Path of Valor, and I've played around with Tempest Weaving in the Dreaming, and now I found your freehold, and I'm going to drag one of those Black Paths of Valor off its course and connect it to your freehold, and you're not going to know that it's there. Then I'm just going to sit back and enjoy the chaos that creates. That's a thing a powerful Wraith could do, specifically a powerful Spectre. I mean, that's the kind of thing that could really make a Wraith a very dangerous enemy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, The other kind of opportunity for crossover that I've always been interested in and I would love to see written up is what happens when an anchor is a fetter. I mean, when you look at fetters and the way that Wraiths regain their passion from them and they can always travel to them, and what happens if like a small child had a doll that they were just in love with and they had this long ongoing relationship on into adulthood. Maybe they were even enchanted multiple times. Maybe they had a real relationship with a mannequin and then they die. And the most important thing in their life is that doll. What does that mean? I mean, I've never seen it written up, but given some of the rules around what fetters do, what fetters represent, and then the fact that once a wraith has a fetter, other wraiths have this whole tool set to hunt down that fetter to see the connections between them. That would be terrifying for an inanime because they're so protective of their anchors. I think there's a lot of potential crossover there that hasn't necessarily been tapped in any written text. Could be the root of the most messed up buddy comedy ever. It could be the root of the most messed up buddy comedy ever. Making <laughs> notes. You don't even have to go with the it, the mannequin route, even if you're like a Kithane game. Like, there's plenty of treasures and uh, mundane aspects to chimerical items and stuff that might be. Yeah, like, what if one of your treasures was also an anchor for a wraith? And maybe the wraith doesn't even know it's a treasure. They only know it in its mundane form. And while they're slumbering in it, you call on the weird. What does that do to the wraith? <laughs> Probably wake them up at the very least. Yeah, that's a big... Probably wake them up or give them some very strange dreams. But whenever we have these sort of discussions about mechanical crossover, though, I sometimes feel like I'm back in algebra class and it's just trying to get these things to connect properly is the difficult part. Well, the nice thing about the world of darkness is you don't need to put in more care to the mechanics than. True the books have so mm-hmm. <laughs> and i never would <laughs> it's so true i mean for me i think i'd go for like a very pedestrian story something like the changelings want to help the wraith keep their haunted house from being plowed under to build condos because it's the source of lots of ghost stories and spoopy feelings in in the local neighborhood or something i have, I have a question too about fetters Victor that has came, mm-hmm. it's come up with this and I can't remember. Can people be fetters or is it objects? Yeah. And, okay. Yeah. Yes. People can be fetters. You can get a little bit abstract with a fetter, um, but only a little bit abstract. It needs the rule that's put in the Wraith book is it needs to be something that could be physically destroyed because mm-hmm. that's a big part of the, the power balance of the game. So like I've had people be like, what if my fetter is like the abstract concept of it? I'm like, no, absolutely not. But one fetter I did for my first con game, I live in Chicago and I live in Uptown and there was a school that was closed down just like two blocks from me. And there had been a large homeless encampment. And so I had one of the characters that I'd written up, one of the PC templates for this con game. I wrote it up as a teacher. She had been a teacher at the school and then she died and the school was her fetter. And then they shut down the school. And even though it wasn't physically destroyed, what it was about it that made it her fetter was destroyed. 
And so she lost it as a fetter and she fell into a harrowing. And it's one of the most traumatic things a wraith can experience is a fetter being destroyed. And then this homeless encampment grew up around it and she sort of built a relationship with the homeless encampment and it became a fetter and it was about protecting all of those people and she wanted better for them and she wanted to serve her community the way she had. And on my way to the con, because it was a con in Chicago, I passed the encampment and it was gone and there was a sign up from the police about keeping the area cleared because construction was going to begin to turn the school into luxury oh, condos. Like on the way to the con to run that game. Life imitates art in every way. Right? <laughs> I That put me in such a strange mood, yeah. but that kind of gives you an idea of like what fetter destruction mm-hmm. is like. Something that popped into my head too is you have, you have a changeling PC, right? And Mm -hmm. someone in their life that was close to them died before their chrysalis. Yeah. And they're now the wraith's fetter. And then they go through the chrysalis. And now the wraith's like, what's wrong (laughs) with you? Well, and the really interesting thing about that is whether or not wraiths experience the mists like everyone else isn't ever really explained. I mean, there is a lot of discussion about do supernaturals experience the mist? How do they experience it? I tried to look up rules on this and I I went way down a rabbit hole online of of debates that have happened on the Onyx Path forums about this for supernaturals more broadly. But a lot of the evidence people were bringing forward that yes, all supernaturals experience the mists still kind of didn't apply to wraiths. And you have these wraiths that have these crystal clear, perfect memories that go back before the sundering, Mm -hmm. you know, the lady of fate, at least maybe nobody else, but at least her. So like that scenario, what happens if a wraith witnesses calling on the weird? What happens if a wraith sees you fly on your chimerical dragon? I mean, the question of what happens if a mortal sees you fly on a chimerical dragon has certainly come up in Changeling often enough and like does their banality cause you to fall maybe it does how you navigate that banality trigger being seen by people who don't believe you varies by storyteller a bit but wraith seeing it would never trigger banality i mean it's very clear you look through changeling if a wraith seeing you do an impossible thing was a banal experience and and invoked disbelief it would happen all the time. Wraiths are everywhere. They're the ultimate peeping toms. It's it's why old Greek necromancy was all about finding out secrets. And so when you stop and think about all of that in that scenario where like this person who is my fetter just went through chrysalis, oh my God, what's going on? This is trauma. Oh no, but they're better now. And they're, what's happening? I can't explain this. But then if you do peek beyond the veil, do you remember it? I mean, these are questions that are not well dealt with for Wraith. And I think that it's kind of nice that they aren't well dealt with because it leaves it up to you as a storyteller. Yeah. So did we want to do the listener questions at this point or? Sure. Yeah, we could we could definitely dive into yeah, those. Yeah, I think we covered a couple okay. of them. By it. Well, we'll ask the question at least. Yeah. Okay. So uh, first one's by Sanchiger. Okay, what's the deal with the Karamet? Would they be better suited as wraiths who get all their passions from changelings and the dreaming itself? So I will just say that question, what is the deal with the Karamet? I have been asking that for years. I don't understand the Karamet. I mentioned earlier that they are effectively the Slua myth. That is the only part of them that makes any sense to me whatsoever. So they're dead people that wander the dreaming. I feel like they're one of one or two groups of Adheen that are not subject to the yeah. silver band. So they can walk on the silver paths because... They're just humans. There's, like there's, they, there's actually they... a surprising number of Adheen that are not <laughs> any way connected to the Fomorians. It's whenever when we eventually get to that book, it's there's going to be a lot to talk about. You know, but... it was it was more of the silver raised eyebrow than the silver band. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I say too. There there are a bunch where like I wasn't connected to the Fomorians, but I didn't side with you, so I'm part of it. Like it's very, it's very extra. Um. <laughs> But the Karamet definitely are not subject to the silver ban. The weird thing about them is they have no emotions. They are these blank, empty, emotionless vessels. And I just, you you get one part changeling, these super glamorous, wondrous, dynamic, 
invigorated things, and you get one part wraith that is driven 110% by passion and emotion and drive, and you mix them and you get like the worst version of Wednesday Adams. And I don't understand that. Um, I just, I don't, I don't know what they were thinking when they wrote that. So, yeah. yeah. Well, some of them, uh, well, they, they have no emotions. And then you read their write-up. We haven't covered them yet, but they have like three courts. Like yeah. th- three legacies or whatever. Mm-hmm. One of their legacies, they have full emotions. <laughs> so, I know. <laughs> so it's all about having no emotions, except for, you know, a third of the time. I mean, the other weird thing with the Karamet is they were written before the tithed. Mm. And when they were first written, there was a very obvious, ooh, are they the human souls that the she cast out? Are the she lying about them, you know, being treated as kings in Arcadia? It wasn't confirmed, but that was one of the like, you know, unreliable narrator maybe things. And then the tithed came out as this confirmed hard plot point. Wait, did the tithed come out? I thought that came out in a... I mean, it was, well, the tithe came out in, like, the End Times book, but... Yeah. uh, So I guess that depends on how you view the Time of Judgment books, but, like, they're in a scenario. They're functional. Like, they're Mm -hmm. there. And you're told what they are. And so then you look over at the Karamet, and you look at the tithe, and you're like, okay, so what is going on here? Um, I actually just posted a pretty long thread on Twitter. I was recently watching um, Over the Garden Wall which is just like great wraith and changeling and general autumnal good times fodder. Hmm. And again, spoiler warnings, if anyone wants to see it and hasn't, I'm about to spoil stuff. So maybe skip ahead a little bit. But the main villain in Over the Garden Wall is drawing all of the hope and passion out of the people who wander in the unknown. The unknown is could very easily be the Black Paths of Batwar. Like it could very easily be a, I died... And because I was close to an opening to the dreaming, I got lost there instead of going where I was supposed to go, kind of that original myth. And then there's some adheen that came and victimized me and took everything away from me. And now I'm left as this shell. And I'm able to use arts and I become of fae, but like I am this shadow of ravaging that's just persisting. And that's very tragic and that's very thematic. And while it's not a big mythic epic explanation it's at least an interesting story explanation and it would be interesting fodder for your players to discover that because someone they care about has been drawn into that cycle and we got to go into the dreaming and save them. I I think there's a lot of potential there. No text to back this up. This is just my musings watching over the garden wall, (laughs) but I wish they would do something like that with the Karamet. (laughs) Um, I don't know where they fit. (laughs) So then ferret asks, what are the common thoughts that wraiths have against Slua and vice versa, if any? I don't know that this is ever really addressed in any text. So everything I'm about to say is a bit speculation. Uh, the Slua at least think pretty fondly of wraiths, maybe cautiously because there are examples in the Slua book and, and warnings here and there that it's like, don't get too involved with wraiths. I mean, that's dangerous. They're powerful, but by and large, I mean, the Slua love all things dark and drear and tragic. And, you know, I, I think the Slua probably really like raids, even if they recognize, be cautious, be careful. In terms of how do raids feel about the Slua? I mean, you get your Sandman who view them as a snack. Mm-hmm. That's not that interesting. I think the Wraiths probably view the Slua a lot the way they view other mediums. And the Medium's book, which is one of the few Wraith books I've not read cover to cover, but I have gone through it a little bit, it was the year of the ally book for Wraith. Mm. I mean, Mediums are their friends. They're their allies. They are one of the safest ways to interface with the living world where they don't have to be kind of garish and obvious about it and draw the attention of dicta mortem enforcers. So the Slua offer a lot of the same options. And the Slua don't really have many tools to harm wraiths. So the Sandmen talk about changelings being dangerous, but that's because the Sandmen are actually walking up into dreams. And you have to imagine if a Sandman walked into a changeling's dreams, even though there aren't strict systems for that, thematically, the changeling could do something about that. You could let them do all kinds of arts and backflips and things to let them 
fight against that, and I generally would be flexible about that. The more obvious approach is a Sandman walks into a dreamer's dream, and an Oniromancer walks into a dreamer's dream. The ensuing fight might not go so well for either party, <laughs> um, but the, it's certainly not going to be a good time for the Wraith, even if they're powerful. I mean, that's that's a a changeling in a dream is a very, very powerful thing. So I think the Sandmen probably view them with more caution. But by and large, if you're not dealing with someone who's in a dream, there isn't a lot the Slua can do to harm a Wraith. So they're more a good ally possibility than anything else. So I think from the common view, obviously lots of exceptions to that, I think they'd actually get along pretty well. Yeah. I mean, you could maybe have a Slua who learns from the Wraith's other Wraith's enemies and then starts mm-hmm. targeting fetters or something. But Yeah, they definitely could. And if a Slua was helping one Wraith by destroying the fetters of their enemies, those other Wraiths who have the fetters being destroyed certainly would not think kindly of the Slua. <laughs> Okay, so we have another question by Ferret. What, if any, commonalities do Oblivion Angst and Dark Glamour have? Which I think we kind of addressed, but... We kind of addressed that. Um, The thing I'll say about Angst, Oblivion is a plot thing. So Oblivion is more equivalent to the Fomorians, whereas Angst is the more close corollary to Dark Glamour. Angst works the way I wish Dark Glamour did. Angst is very relative. So your shadow is all about the things about you that you hate. So say you have two people who die and they were both into BDSM. And for one of them, they had a very healthy relationship with it. They had positive relationships with people. They took part in proper safety protocols. It was an enriching part of their life. They just liked weird kinky things. But you have another person who had all those same desires and felt shame about them their entire life. And they did it in a terrible way. They didn't really do any of the proper safety navigation because that would be to acknowledge that it was normal and like they couldn't stop themselves from doing it, but they couldn't acknowledge that either. One of those people could die and their shadow would have nothing to do with BDSM. Maybe they have other baggage they need to deal with. And they could still engage with that form of sexuality as a wraith and sexuality and wraiths is a whole thing. It's amazing what you can do when you skin ride someone. Just going to put that out there. Whereas the other wraith that had the very negative relationship with all of those dynamics, that's going to be shadow fodder. That's going to, that's going to draw up terrible negative self-destructive emotions for them. And so angst is always relative to what a given wraith loathes about themselves. It is always rooted in, a personal manifestation of shame. Hmm. Dark glamour, I wish was a little more like that. I wish it was more personal and about the nightmares of a particular person and the the ways that Thelaine tap that and, and draw it out. I wish it had more of a relationship with banality. I think if dark glamour were more relative, the dark fey are banal line from earlier editions would make more sense because when banality was banality and glamour was glamour, Dark Fae being banal didn't make any sense. And that's when they were banal in the text. And then you get to C20 where banality is relative and glamour is relative generally. And then suddenly the Dark Fae aren't banal anymore. But I'm like, tell me a Svartal Thar isn't banal to a she. Mm-hmm. You know, they would be. Tell me a knocker or like a goblin. Well, tell, t- tell me a she aren't banal to some commoners, but... <laughs> Oh, absolutely. I mean, I th- I think if we're going to have relative banality, we shouldn't have thrown out the dark fey or banal. We should have leaned into, they're not banal in absolute terms. They're absolutely of the dreaming and the deep dreaming wouldn't see them as banal. The deep dreaming would just be like, well, this is another story. Mm-hmm. But to the seely fey struggling to exist, that's going to drag them further towards their end. Mm-hmm. And I wish there'd been more of that. But that's not how it's written, unfortunately. So, you know, there it is. I imagine part of that is just the difficulty of trying to operationalize that as a mechanic, because that makes it so much more granular and in a way turns it more into wraith, which might not be a bad thing. Yeah, I would agree. That would be hard to systematize. And they were taking on a lot with C20. Yeah. I think if they'd maybe taken a little more time to figure out what to do with Nightmare and Dark Glamour 
and have that be a co- like one thought instead of like mixing bedlam and nightmare hmm. they would have gotten somewhere closer to what mm-hmm. i'm imagining as soon as they made nightmare about bedlam though it had to be a whole different thing yeah so then lucid asks what are some ideas for changeling pcs to be involved with wraiths that don't involve poke the slua in pcs or npcs to do the thing yeah i feel like we talked about some of this but yeah there are definitely more options there i think the big one is leaning on the wraith to do the communication because they have a huge tool set for that i think if you're the sort of motley that wants to go into the dreaming you've got lots of options with the black paths of balor i also think reintroducing spirit talk i know that that's explicitly a nunyahi art and you know i have mixed feelings about making that available more broadly it's why i kind of wish it was brought back not as an art because i do like the arts as as broad archetypical things but maybe even acknowledging oh hey we need to reach out to the dead we don't have a, a slua i hear the nunya he actually have like a more robust relationship with the dead maybe we want to go talk with the nunya he which is a whole like we know that's going to be a hard political conversation because they often don't want to have anything to do with us for reasons. Yeah. But that that could become a really interesting plot point. Like we need to go through that and all the Nunya here are kind of like, y'all are so weird. Like why, why, why is this a thing? Why don't you just like deal with your roots? And that could create some really interesting social tensions. And to your point about fetters in particular being kind of touchstones with the material world for wraiths, I'm thinking about cases where you know, you have an individual person or place and just the dynamics of changelings and wraiths interacting with it. I mean, the difficulty with getting them in touch with each other aside, I could foresee a situation like a wraith asking a troll to take an oath to protect their child who was their fetter, or like hiring an issue to go track down the fetter that they lost, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think those would be amazing stories. Um, I think there's a lot of possibility there. The other easy one, and this involves going a little fringe on Wraith, is using the Risen. Mm. Because as soon as you have a Risen, there's a physical body to interact with and all of the logistic problems kind of go away. And then, yeah, last questions from Fayhammer. Personal stances on the whole darkest game line debate. Yeah, we did touch on that a little bit. I mean, this is something I think we could probably all all have opinions on um <laughs> i i have mixed feelings on the whole changeling as darkest game line thing i i think it has the most potential to be dark like if you play the trauma dynamics of ravaging if you play the self-denial dynamics of changelings to their fullest if you play the i am going to fall to banality and you you really emphasize that You have to tweak some of the systems. The banality systems are more forgiving than the text in my experience. But if you go, I'm going to pump this so it it matches the text, all of the the bright, shiny, shimmery stuff in Changeling really starts to just feel like a coping mechanism. It's kind of like um, Centaur World, if anyone watched that. That series is so bright and ridiculous at first, but it gets really really dark like i cried through the finale it was brutal at the end of that series and i feel like changeling was designed to be that it doesn't always turn into that but not everybody wants to play it that way um and i've talked with a lot of people that want their cute puka and they want to play a brighter version of it and that can get on the nerves of some world of darkness players but at the end of the day like whatever brings you joy like i want the game to be there and be developed and have a corner for everybody to love it. So I don't think Changeling is the darkest game. I think it can be the darkest game. I similarly think Wraith can be the darkest game if you don't find that hope in it. Like just that realization that a specter, the deepest, darkest, most horrible thing in the world of darkness. And like, all I have to say is the art in Dark Reflection Specters is some of the most grotesque, horrifying stuff they ever published. And it does line up with the text. Where like the argument of are the Nefandi or the Spectres worse is an argument you have to have. Even they have redemption. Like that's there, but you have to go looking for it. Mm-hmm. So I think it's if you don't find that contrast, I think for more people, Wraith is the darkest game. Like you need to do the lift to realize how horrible dreaming can be. And you need to do the lift to realize that Wraith isn't as horrible as it seems to be. 
Yeah. And sometimes they're just their surface games, you know? I, I do feel like Changeling's more likely to also blindside somebody not expecting the darkness to show up. Yes. I totally agree with that. Changeling is the only game I've ever had players X card. Hmm. Yeah. I've run Wraith. I've run Wraith hard. Nobody's ever X carded because they kind of sit down knowing what they're getting into. When I really have a red cap go at it, I haven't even had to go Thelane. Like the first time I just had red caps being real, real creepy and predatory at a con game, it was like, oh, okay, we're stopping the scene now because people don't see it coming. (laughs) Yeah, I I ran maybe like 10 sessions or something with my two kids when they were 11 and 13. That was the darkest game. <laughs> also, kids are darker than we give them credit for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is so true. I think I agree overall with your statement, though, that it can be the darkest game. And in some sense, it depends on what kind of darkness you want. So you can go in any kind of nightmarish direction with Changeling, or you can go in the direction of no matter what you do, eventually you're going to forget yourself and fade away. And they're very different kinds of darkness for a character to grapple with but they're they're optional to an extent the level of engagement that you have with them yeah i would definitely agree with that i mean dreaming is interesting because you have this slow creeping quiet emotional horror Mm -hmm. or you have chthonic horror and like weirdly the chthonic horror can save you from the slow creeping horror yeah (laughs) i there was this idea. I was I ran a changeling game in the Great Depression at one point. It was like a full-on dust bowl changelings riding the rails across the US kind of story because I always thought, man, what a perfect long winter setting. And the thing that I realized about halfway through that chronicle is dark glamour is the immune system of the dreaming because when mm-hmm. all hope dies, horror still lives. And once horror has taken enough of a root, hope can come back in the form of conquering the horror. And I just thought about that cycle and the cycle of the history of Changeling. And I went, there's something there. Yeah. And like, man, the Dust Bowl was a great time to tap it. I don't know that I tapped it perfectly, but like once I had that thought, I really tried to like get at that with that campaign. It, I maybe like half succeeded. It's kind of like the things that you see with in the era of the Black Death, the kind of flowering of really macabre art and how how people coped with the horrors happening around them by creating to to some extent. Yeah, and I think I think that's very true with the Black Death. I also think back to a lot of the stories people tell me about the 70s and the 80s and how hmm. horrible things were politically But like, man, look at the rock music and the punk movements and the creative movements that came out of those time periods. And I take the everything was better back then with a grain of salt. I think there's a (laughs) lot of great stuff happening today. But I do think there's some truth to the fact that uh, there were a lot of big spikes of creativity that did come out of reaction to some pretty horrible things. I just taught a course last term on queer culture and media, and we had an extended discussion about the art of the AIDS era and like what came out of that as well. So that's the kind of thoughts it summons up. Yeah, I would have loved to have been in that class. That sounds fascinating. It was a hoot and a half, but anyway. So do you guys have any other questions for me or thoughts? No. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have have any projects or things or places, places to reach you online? So the best way to reach me online is Twitter. And I am, oh, I'm a terrible person and I don't know my own Twitter handle by heart. (laughs) So I am Kinzer underscore V on Twitter. And that's the place I'm most active on social media right now. In terms of projects, I don't have an active podcast project right now. I wish I did. But there's a very long archive for walking away from arcadia.podbean.com if you're interested in mine simon's sometimes quite rambling musings on changeling and then i did a short podcast on wraith that unfortunately due to life getting in the way i, I won't get into all of did it what get that the race it wasn't curse, all mine your pod it did <laughs> kind of get the wraith curse unfortunately no. i won't share everything that happened because that that isn't all stuff that happened to me it isn't even mostly stuff that happened to me but there are a few episodes i'm actually very proud of those episodes i just wish we'd been able to do more of them 
I have a couple books I've contributed to on the Storyteller's Vault. The one I did most work on was a, a mage text called Phoenix Rising, which um, mm. I think is a pretty good mage scenario, and it's hard it's hard to do a good mage scenario. But I contributed to a couple changeling things as well, more as editor and, and backup on those. And then right now, because I'm having a hard time, like, hunting down the bandwidth and time to do big projects. I've just recently started doing like long Twitter threads that are media inspired changeling the dreaming ponderings. So the whole thing about over the garden wall, I just posted on Twitter as a thread. And I'm trying to start from a piece of media and say, hey, how could we inform the way we do changeling based on this piece of media? Some people have shown interest and I can put them together quickly enough to get stuff out there. So that's the big thing I'm doing now. I'm I'm hoping I circle back to having the the bandwidth and time to do bigger projects, but right now it's it's kind of bite-sized nibbles. To which there will be links in the show notes. So thanks for coming on our show, Victor. Um hopefully we can have you on again sometime. Yeah. So yeah, so you can reach us, you can reach our social media links. We have Twitter at changelingcast. We're on Facebook as Changeling the Podcast. There's our website, changelingthepodcast.com. You can email us at podcast at changelingthepodcast.com. And you can find at on our changelingthepodcast.com website a link to our Discord if you want to come hang out there. And we also have a Patreon. What's the name of the Patreon? <laughs> Patreon.com slash changelingthepodcast. And uh, yeah, so I've been Josh. Puka's here as well. And Victor for this episode yeah as always and uh yeah if you do find yourself in a harrowing just treat it as a teachable moment good advice for all our listeners dead or undead or anything in between we wish you a very happy and spoopy all hallows eve along with our fervent hopes that you have found some inspiration from this discussion of all things wraithly we also extend particular thanks to our patrons for their support in making this show possible derek ras kabooz sanjigar sija and terry robinson If you'd like to help us continue to produce Changeling the Dreaming-related content for your listening edification, please feel free to leave us a review on the podcast listening platform of your choice, and or visit our Patreon at www.patreon.com slash changelingthepodcast. Until next time, tread carefully around the edge of oblivion, and keep on dreaming.